So um, very relevant to the last breakout session we have, what I'm going to talk through is the um, where we're going with the whole combination of human plus machine. So um, in, for this presentation, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a brief introduction about the whole concept of human plus machine, talk about the drivers and the impacts of that, um, speak specifically about autonomous operations, what we mean by that, what the um, what is being done, what can be done, and what the implications are. And then I'm not going to talk about the workforce of the future. I'm going to talk about the workforce of now, of the now, because it, we, we really are already in the workforce of the future. I'm open to any Q&A at the end, but equally feel free to put your hand up and ask a question throughout. I'm sharing my screen, so I can't see questions. But Emma, Andrew, if anyone asks a question, don't worry about interrupting me. Feel free to just do so, and we can we can address that as I go along. Okay, will do. Thanks. So, human plus machine. Um, this I like this quote from Bill Gates because it is so true to um, behavioural science and uh, the the way the human mind works. We always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next ten. That is a classic human behaviour. If we consider that the iPhone came out only just just under 13 years ago now and the, the smartphone came out a year after that and how much that those have changed the way in which we we work we live our daily lives um it, it's almost mind-blowing so when when you see some of the some of the mining companies but even other companies are creating targets around 2050 it always makes me chuckle but also cry inside because in 30 years time we have no idea what this world will look like it's it's too far out there will be too much change for us to even contemplate at the moment so I, I would always consider if we've got any strategies that we're developing to look at the five to ten year time frame i'm now going to um, play this video which is a a video that we put together in accenture really thinking about the future of autonomous mining and we put this together at based on an, on an ask by one of our major mining companies, um, who's a, a multinational, multi-commodity mining company, who, who asked us to help them shape their strategy for autonomous operations. In 2035, of that. we live in a world where mining operations yes, are neither seen okay. nor heard. Yet they are experiencing unprecedented levels of efficiency. They are attracting gifted students from the best colleges to a workforce where employees operate safely with a shared purpose. It is a world where our minds give back to the planet and steward our resources for the long term. Whilst investing in local communities and providing opportunities for development, they are respected, responsible, and always innovating. This is the new world of mining, powered by autonomous operations. So our, our vision there, and, and we're projecting out to 2035, I, I suspect that we'll reach this um, reach this concept much sooner and some of our, our some of our major mining companies are actually working on new projects that are are entirely designed about around minimizing their environmental footprint and maximizing autonomy um, but what we're talking about is a mines that um, that that are do not create the same impact as we have mines today either socially or economically um in terms of the obviously in terms of the negative impacts because there's a lot of positive impacts socially from mining but we we have unprecedented levels of efficiency and productivity the employees um have have their needs considered as human beings and have have a purpose they understand what they're doing and they feel fulfilled the environment is safe to work in, the communities are safe to be close to the mine, that the mine itself is stewarding our, our natural resources. Um, and the miners have moved from this 
concept of resource production or mineral production that they push to market to actually being resource stewards. So they're, they're part of the community, but they're also part of the global effort to manage our limited natural resources. And central to this vision really is autonomy. And I'll talk in a little bit about what, what we mean by autonomy. But what we're seeing, the shift that we're seeing uh, is minds moving from those that were designed for maximizing production um, without any consideration for the, require, the, the, the levels of energy required and the levels of water required in terms of minimizing that, rather just saying this is how much we need and how can we secure that from, from the, the regional or, or um, national government. Uh, we were just talking on, in the breakout session about how siloed mining is and it remains siloed. We need to address that. Um, always organized by the activity or the segment of the value ch chain, uh, limited data, limited interoperability, um, human beings doing a, a large part of the, the work. Uh, mine's designed for economies of scale, so the bigger the better, um, and then uh, and built around this predetermined mine plan. So you're, you're always operating to a plan but as soon as you start operating more than likely that plan is no longer valid because something happens that sends you off plan and you you have no you no capability to update it or limited capability to update it and you um you're you're chasing your tail basically throughout the shift and then you report how how far off plan you you were at the end of the um end of the shift so everything is this plan deci driven decision making and what we're moving to is maximizing productivity. So maximizing the output versus input, minimizing our waste, energy, water, and environmental footprint, and developing minds that have this decision autonomy. So not only automated equipment, but also the processes um, are, are autonomous. And we have a, a more integrated way of working with interoperability between systems humans working in remote operating centers or integrated operating centers. The mines are scaled for economics and, and agile so they can respond to market conditions rather than trying to maintain a fixed steady state. Um, and we're customer driven with, with live or dynamic mine planning. And everything is based on data. So that situational awareness is key. But what's driving this? Well very uh, on the, the very highest level we're in the fourth industrial wave i'm sure most people have heard this the first was when we introduced water and steam into industry second was introducing electricity into industry third was introducing computers into industry and the fourth is really around the internet connectivity um and the connect uh, the, the the systemic approach as well as now what we're seeing is human plus machine. So that's not just robots, that's what they call cobots, which are collaborative robots. And enabling what humans do, not necessarily replacing them, but enabling what they do with machine. Why has this come about? Um, this diagram illustrates the development of technology um, over the last 70 years. And you can see that the incremental um, and an exponential development in technology in the last 20 years has changed our entire way of living and working. The key, key um, developments for the last 12 or so years have been connected devices, analytics, machine learning, and certainly platform and cloud and mobile technology. Artificial intelligence and quantum computing are absolutely what we will see in the next five years to be changing, um, changing dramatically again our workplaces and our and our home. For those who don't know what quantum computing is, it's it's basically computing on a um, on a molecular scale or, or on a atomic scale, and the um, scientists have already been able to store data on DNA as well as on an uh, on an atom. So binary data of zero or one on an atom, and this is what quantum computing is. And what we anticipate it to change is the capability to do all that scenario modeling and processing in a very short period of time. 
So where once we ran a resource estimation and left the computer on overnight, you just push a button and you'll get your updated resource estimation. In an operational setting, this means that you can always be working based on the latest plan because it will be continuously updating and, and giving you the, the what's the best next action if something changes. So also drivers for this for this change. Um, the mining industry is definitely moving to a, a, a new path with a redefined purpose, moving away from being mineral producers to stewarding our natural resources and really trying to be a force for good. And you see that with the um, with the, the taglines of some of the major miners, you know, wanting to change change society for the better. Why has this come about? Um, for one, the the there's been a distinct shift from shareholder value to stakeholder value. So it, all stakeholders are now considered equal. The loudest voices over the last six 12, to 12 months have in fact been the institutional investors, funnily enough, because they know that if, they're, if the miners aren't addressing sustainability, including climate change and environmental, social and governance, their investment is at risk. So it, it, they, it might sound out, they might, they might sound like they're being altruistic, but really fundamentally, it's because their investment is at risk if they don't ad address all stakeholders and provide value for all stakeholders. Sustainability is a key driver of that. Um, climate change is no longer a, a, a niche consideration. It is mainstream, and everybody must do whatever they can to address climate change. And all of our miners are looking at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Some of them have um, had originally 2050 targets, and they've now moved that in line with the Paris Agreement. And the circular economy, um, the, the miners are, are sitting up and listening to and taking heed of and building it into their strategies because they're concerned that others will disrupt, um, disrupt their markets. So it's important for them to include that. And we see that with them. Um, with some of the miners creating supply chain partnerships with the likes of Nespresso to, to provide Rio Tinto and Nespresso. So Rio provides what's called responsible aluminium to Nespresso for all their, all their coffee capsules. Um, and that responsible aluminium is aluminium produced with renewable energy and not impinging on, um, on human rights. So we already see those kind of partnerships being created. The workforce, I will talk a little bit about um, later on in the presentation, there is a changing demographic of that workforce. That is a, that is a good thing. Um, so different generations are now dominating our, our workforce with different approaches and different attitudes. And then the human plus machine piece, how do we manage that? What are the new ways of learning and working and increasing performance? C customers. Um, not only of the as immediate off takers of of the um, products of mining, but also as end use con customers are choosing sustainable products um, wherever possible. They're wanting products that can be re reused that are made with renewable energy. So that is driving back up the value chain. And where in the past we had miners who produced a product, pushed it to market, and that was the end of their involvement. As I mentioned with supply chain partners, that's no longer the case. We're seeing an, an extension of the mining value chain to all the way to, to end users. Um, Samsung has just um, signed an agreement with, with Glencore to ensure supply for five years of cobalt from their mines in the DRC. Um, that, that is one so that they can say to their customers, we know exactly where this mineral comes from, but two, because Glencore have agreed that there will be no infringement on human rights, so they can, they can ensure that they're sourcing cobalt from, um, from a responsible source. Safety is absolutely still number one priority. We're still not getting it right. Of the ICMM members on the last years of safety data, um, no, no one company had managed the year without fatalities. So we're still not getting it right. We can do more, we can do better. Technology is a way to do that. Autonomous operation is a way to do that. And obviously operational excellence because that's, that's your productivity and profit. For, for extension, this translates to what we call triple zero target of mining. So zero harm, zero loss, zero waste. Zero harm is around not, not only health, safety, environment and communities, but also governance and social trust and cybersecurity. Zero loss is all around um, 
the uh, productivity of, of mining and, and ultimately the bottom line and zero waste is around um, addressing those, those issues for climate change, reducing your carbon, uh, your global, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, reducing your, your, your um, primary water consumption and, and creating closed systems um, and ensuring that you're embracing the circular economy, um, recycling, recovering, um, extracting value from waste, etc. So, autonomous operations, leveraging human and machine. Before I go into more detail about autonomous operations, it's, it's helpful to, um, to think about the terminology. It's worth clarifying what we mean by autonomous operations. As, as many would think of autonomous op operations as remote control equipment. So, there are three degrees of autonomy. If we consider mine trucks as an example, no, an automated mine truck, the, the truck follows a pre-programmed journey from A to B, unconnected to surrounding equipment and operated by a central control system. Um, human intervention is required, particularly when circumstances stray from the program conditions. If, if something, an, if an obstacle gets in its way, the truck can no longer um, move forward. It, it doesn't have the capability to understand what's around it. Autonomous is the, the truck is operating independently, adjusting to changes in conditions or obstacles in the programmed path with no human intervention. So it has situational awareness. Um, it can feed that back to a central control system. And there's coordination between connected equipment by remote operators, so still by humans. And autonomy is uh, the truck is connected to other trucks but also other pieces of equipment each piece of equipment has situational awareness of themselves and the other equipment in the system and the operation occurs independently the equipment has systemic decision making autonomy for the best overall outcome without human intervention so for example if if one truck um there's an obstacle in the way of one truck say there's been a, a landslip then the, the other trucks may know that they need to um, go and move to that shovel so that they can still continue production from that shovel. If a crusher goes down, all the trucks may be notified to send material to the other crusher. But this happens automatically. We anticipate this to be the case by 2035 at the latest. That being said, it all begins with data and that on the right hand side there, the top diagram is what we typically see in mining is um, the data flow is linear, confined or siloed by discipline or segment of the value chain and um, flowing from upstream to downstream with very little feedback. Um, and what we're moving to is multidisciplined, multidirectional flow in a fully integrated value chain. This requires that data readiness, data engineering, fit for purpose data and, and the infrastructure around that data, as well as the necessary analytics for the insights <clears throat> and machine learning and artificial intelligence for predictive capabilities. So it's all well and good to have the right data, to have that in near real time. So you have the where relevant, so you have the situational awareness. But only if you do something with that data is any value created or any risk mitigated. Um, what, what do we see as a roadmap to intelligent operations? So to, to really to that decision making autonomy. And what we're trying to get to is data driven decision making rather than plan driven decision making, because as we know in mining, the, the plan is almost always out of date as soon as you start the shift. Um, integrated planning and dynamic scheduling optimization and dynamic supply chains. And, and really ultimately that decision-making autonomy where the system itself can make the decisions. I spoke to the head of innovation at one of our major miners and, um, and asked him what his opinion was, was on the, the future of mining. Where does he see mining in 15 years time? And he said, well, I, I see it as a, there's only one human on site and a dog. And I said, oh, it's a dog to keep the human company. And he said, no, the dog's there to, to bite the hand of the man if he, um, or woman, if he, uh, if he touches any of the dials. 
so that that is where we're heading is the the system itself is able to run the operation the, there's a, a process to increase the sophistication of those systems and i appreciate that currently we are and still in some places lacking that very basic digital data allowing us the situational awareness but ideally what you create is that situational awareness you can then start to integrate between different segments of the value chain you can then automate based on where the biggest risks are and where the biggest value is or cost saving is you can automate processes and actions you can then run with the right computing capability run um, scenario modeling to optimize what those actions would be including predictive capabilities so predictive modeling um, and then you you get to a point where you can create this decision making autonomy within the system what i've shown what i show here in this diagram doesn't mean to say that you need to do that end to end across the value chain in order to um, advance through this maturity process um, what what we recommend is that you start with where your high risk areas are or where your uh, where your value opportunities sit um, and and address that and then as you build it up you may have some areas that are more sophisticated than others but as you build it up you can create this connectivity and technology is moving to interoperability um, so it that enables it 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 to be a an incremental almost jigsaw process of connecting systems and processes together. Um, uh, how are we enabling this? We've got a whole bunch of new building blocks. Some of these I've mentioned before. Um, a, a couple I will mention here is uh, the distributed ledger is blockchain. And we see a number of the miners using blockchain to demonstrate provenance of mineral, but also to um, to improve socioeconomics locally and and nationally in company in countries, so they're now using blockchain to help the uh, local the artisanal miners in Sierra Leone, so the diamond miners in Sierra Leone, to join the um, the diamond market because they can prove then they can show where those diamonds come from, and this uplifts the socioeconomics not only locally but also nationally. Where are we moving um, from today? Today we have a lack of digital data integration and and still a problem with interoperability. We are there are many addressing that in the industry. We typically have limited insights and limited timely diagnostics. We've got a siloed value chain and um, and siloed performance review. So, for example, if you look at the crusher, quite often it's just depicted as a problem with the crusher. The crusher was down for X number of minutes of the day without considering. Is, is someone saying something? Uh, no, I think that was a, a bit, uh, since you did stop, I, I do have a, a, um, a comment uh, or question yep. from Douglas. Uh, he said, uh, fantastic, all great. However, um, in third world countries, the threat to jobs is still, as autonomy is implemented, is, is still a issue. Um, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, and um, uh, that's a, a good point. And it is a point that's raised quite commonly and um, quite frequently when we talk with clients who've got a large number of operations in developing nations where their social license to operate is dependent on giving um, a certain proportion of, uh, of jobs to the local market and um, that, that that has to be factored in uh, what I will say is I mean there's, there's no getting around that if the government says you must create X amount of jobs and you must have 80% of your workforce from the literally the region in which the mine sits you will have to meet those um, meet those demands as part of your part of your licensing agreement but what I will say is everybody will rethink that post COVID-19 we are going to see a, a, a significant increase in people wanting to move to not necessarily fully autonomous operations, but wanting to remove humans from the operations in insofar as possible. Now that might be moving humans to a remote operating center, which is more easily managed 
um, in the event that you've got a, some sort of lockdown um, rather than having people on site. But I would imagine it's also going to be uh, automating some processes where possible. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, no worries. Um, so um, one of the biggest things we see as an issue today is the uh, um, people are struggling still with this work is, working practice change. We talk about change management in the same way that we would approach a, an, uh, an implementation of a new piece of software in the past where uh, the, the company, the operator has selected a new piece of software, say for geology or geotechnics or mine planning, whatever it is, and you, you remove the legacy software and you implement the new software from the go live day and you train everybody up on that. And autonomous operations and, and in fact our, our changes to the way we're working with the access to data isn't about that flash in the pan change management training people. It's about a new way of working entirely where you're continually reviewing and updating and innovating. So it's, a, it's moving from a very fixed mindset where we used to, um, we used to design minds with a fixed system and, um, uh, and once that was implemented, everybody was trained on it and that's the way they did their job to uh, uh, everything continuously changing. With a machine learning model, you need to review the data all the time to make sure that it's still relevant to the, the, the conditions on the mine. And as we know in mining, we're never working the same bit of the ore body. So unless you've got an incredibly uniform ore body, potentially coal, possibly iron ore, you will always have to have to relook at, re, re um, assess your machine learning models, your algorithms to ensure that they're up to date with the latest data. Um, we've got also one point to note on there is we've got our traditional tailings, which which the entire world is going to try and move away from. So our target operations really are a much more integrated way of working. Um, we've, we've got uh, dry stack tailings here. We've got a, a lot of um, renewable energy to power the mine. We've got remote operating center. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got bulk sorting, which is reducing the amount of energy required to process the material by that mineral or ore characterization early on, the mineral tracking and allowing you to separate ore from waste. So you're not sending it through the process plant. And the keys to this really are your, your data readiness, which everybody can do now, regardless of how sophisticated your technology is, um, that applying some analytics for situational awareness, first of all, so you can see what's happening, diagnostic, so you can understand why something's happening, predictive, so that you can um, mitigate any risk and take take action or or, or capture value, um, and then prescriptive, which is giving instruction as to what's the next best action if the situation should change, and certainly moving towards integrated operations where disciplines are working together and sitting together. Our miners that we've developed remote operating centers or into integrated operating centers for have found a significant increase in productivity just by having different disciplines sitting together. Making zero harm a reality, we did a study back in 2017 with the World Economic Forum that looked at autonomous operations, robotic, well, it looked at digitization of mining and metals and found that specifically for autonomous operations, robotics and remote operating centers, there's a potential reduction of over 20,000 injuries and almost 500 lives saved per annum. Making zero loss the reality, the typical cost of downtime per incident is $180,000. So that's the crusher going down for some reason, the long wall miner stopping for some reason. Um, and that lost profit is, is up to $3,000 per hour for every equipment failure incident. So there is a huge amount of money to be saved by pre preventing unplanned downtime. And the, the zero waste piece, obviously with climate change, there's a, um, a, a driver for all of our miners to reduce global, uh, sorry, greenhouse gas emissions, and also to reduce the energy that they need to consume in the first place. Um, and 
grinding consumes 50%, on average, 50% of mine site energy, which is up to 4% over all the mining in the world, it's up to 4% of the electrical energy requirement globally. So if you can bulk sort, um, you can prevent that, that waste getting to the, the mill, um, and therefore you're going to reduce your energy consumption. You will have a knock-on effect in reducing your cost but you will also decrease the impact to climate change. How, how do you get there? I'm not going to go into this um, slide in detail. I'm just going to raise a few points. First of all, start with your, um, your areas of risk, uh, where your bottlenecks are, which are those, those are your rate determining steps, um, where the value opportunity sits, what's your data readiness, and that's something anybody can start now regardless of whether you intend to embark on autonomy or um, autonomous operations in the next year or five years or ten years and um, the location as as uh, i think it was douglas who asked the question earlier the location will have an impact because for example that if the government requires that you maintain the workforce the headcount of the workforce you you will have to think about how how you can automate the mine without actually reducing that workforce and upskilling is, is key or reskilling. Um, and then again, workforce readiness, but define the vision, understanding those prioritization criteria and those potential challenges. Um, create your business case um, for focusing on your risk and value opportunity. Understand where you're at at the moment with the maturity assessment and prioritize based on that maturity assessment. Undertake a baseline study to measure the current situation. You, you wouldn't believe the amount of people we, we work with, the amount of operators we work with that haven't actually undertaken a baseline study. So they don't know where they're starting from. So when they ask, well, what's the return on investment? You say, well, we can tell you that. You've got to tell us where you are at the moment. And then you build a roadmap based on that prioritization and this is not something to be to be done alone um, Accenture doesn't like working as sole source we like to work as a partner ecosystem and um, miners are better off working in a partner ecosystem I think all of the miners anyone on the call who's ever uh, it, it, manage to get themselves in, to a point where they have only one OEM as their as their key provider, it becomes a little bit problematic. You need to be a consortium of, of companies and, and it needs to be continuously updated, as I mentioned before. Critical success factors, some of these I've mentioned already, data readiness, connectivity and infrastructure is key. There's often a concern, oh, well, what about if the internet goes down and we're on the cloud? You can create what's called edge computing, where you have some server capability locally, some, some larger storage capability locally. And then once you're reconnected to the internet, to the cloud, you can update. So it, it's about managing the, um, the situation that you're in, which would somewhat depend on geography. Um, interoperability is key. A lot of the, uh, the software providers to mining are actually working on interoperability. Those that aren't, I would I would suggest will see themselves as extinct in the next few years, but a lot of them are already working on making sure that they are interoperable with with other software providers. Workforce we'll talk about in um in a little bit. Uh, cybersecurity is critical. I, this is uh, received um, uh, not enough attention. The more connected we are, the more reliant on automated systems we are, the more important cybersecurity gets. And it, it only takes one, um, uh, either a, a, a staff member who makes a, a silly mistake and clicks on a link in an email, which is more often than not how, how a hacker gets in or how a virus is spread. Um, a, a small mistake can actually stop operations. We've seen this already in Europe on some, um, some metals operations where the plant has been hacked and shut down. So big, big cost implications, but also safety implications. And then operating at multiple speeds. None of what I'm suggesting is about ripping and replacing. Uh, I think there was a, a discussion when I joined earlier about whether you can retrofit autonomous solutions to fleet. Um, it's very much about understanding what your life of 
life of equipment is at the moment, but also looking at automating process. And you can build integrated platforms pulling in from, from your current systems and then remove those systems when uh, as the capability of that integrated platform makes those legacy systems obsolete. So key is about people. What's the impact of humans of this and what, how are humans impacting mining? This is not workforce of the future, this is workforce of the now. Um, we've, we did some, uh, some research in 2018, so a couple of years ago, but it's very valid now. And our, our research showed that uh, by, by 2024, which is only three and a half years away, um, we, only 10% of employees will be working on site in mining. And 60%, we expect 60% fewer permanent workers. Now, this may change as a result of COVID-19. So the, the, we may get even less employees working on site as a, as a result of COVID-19, but we might get more permanent workers because the, the, the people who've been hit hardest, apart from those who are, who are obviously sick and those who've died, are those who are on contract work or self-employed um, and where they don't have a guaranteed income, they don't have access to healthcare. So that may well change as a result of what's happening at the moment. Um, in, in the same study, who will be running your mine in the future, we looked at what proportion of worker time will be impacted by intelligent technologies. And 48% of worker time is augmentable. 42% is all automated, could be automated. And 10%, only 10%, of worker time will not be impacted. So it's really critical to enhance the human experience, blending human and artificial intelligence to create these sort of superhuman abilities, um, empowering humans to learn and reskill to navigate complex systems, and, and developing new strategies. So understanding what the new trends are and creating data insights to explore artificial intelligence enabled futures. We're in the process of a, in the middle of a project we're doing with one of our major miners um, to develop a machine learning tool that will speed up geological modeling. So that's not about replacing the geologist, it's about rather than the geological model being produced and the, the, the interpolation between drill holes and building the solids around for the geological model and creating the block model being produced in six months reducing that time to a matter of for only four weeks. So it's often not about replacing people, it's about speed to execution. Um, I, I'm sure, I think I showed this, or some of this slide last year in, uh, in Lilia. Um, where do we anticipate the skills requirement for the workforce of the future? Now, it doesn't, won't come as any surprise that basic digital skills are expected to increase. Um, advanced tech skills such as programming, solution architecture, app development will and are increasing, demand for are increasing, and those can come from outside the mining, traditional mining, um, uh, mining capabilities. Social and emotional skills, so leadership, managing others, training and transitioning, uh, helping people become more adaptable are going to be much needed and that is not emphasized enough we're focusing a lot on stem so science technology engineering and math as this study from murdoch university uh, indicates there 70 percent of future jobs will be stem but actually i i would suggest that that is going to be lower or should be lower because we need these social and emotional skills um, and cognitive skills, which are the core skills your brain uses to think, read, learn, um, remember, to reason and pay attention are needed for that creativity, design skills, imagination and, and innovation. So continuous learning is critical to the future of our industry. And then basic cognitive skills, data input and processing can be done by computers and physical manual and manual skills. Well, that, that can all also be automated by robots. So we, we don't expect um, uh, those who, who simply have that 
to uh, to continue to be needed in the workforce. But what we what we really need to do is reskill and upskill people. But it's not just about skills. Um, so Google did a, a, a two year study um, looking at 180 high and low performing teams to understand what a team, what makes a team effective. It was called Project Aristotle in line with the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And they found the results incredibly surprising because the number one requirement was psychological safety. So this is the, the capability to speak up, to make a suggestion and um, feel safe to do so without being ridiculed and, but also make a mistake and it's not held against you. There's not a finger of blame anytime anything goes wrong in a project. That is absolutely number one for a high performing team. We're all in this together. We are a team. There isn't blame. Every, every question is a good question and every suggestion is a good suggestion. Number two, dependability. So when someone says they'll do something, they'll, they'll do it. Number three, structure and clarity. That that's not doesn't come as a surprise, certainly to me, because I think every human being needs to know what's expected of them and um, and w where their role sits. Meaning speaks to the generational difference and meaning is about purpose. So the work the work I do is is meaningful and and I have a certain purpose or that the team member has a purpose. And that really is it critical when we consider the different generations. And then impact, you're, you're making a difference. You're, you're generating value. Otherwise, what, what, what point would you be there? We all run a business. The researchers also discovered, interestingly, which variables were not significantly connected with team effectiveness. Um, one co-location of teams didn't make a difference. So now we're all learning to work remotely. Um, for those of us who haven't worked from home before, we're learning to work from home in a home environment. I hope a certain proportion of this will be a new normal, um, not least because it would save us all from traveling so much and impacting the environment in that way. Um, the extroversion of team members, which has long been held as a positive quality for business, was not, a, not significantly connected with, with their team effectiveness, though it is um, it is worth pointing out that it, it, you need to understand who is an extrovert and who is an introvert, and that isn't about how much someone is able to talk and engage. That is about how someone recharges. So an extrovert recharges by spending time with people, an introvert recharges by spending time in quiet and generally by themselves. Um, that is really important for keeping the team going to understand when an extrovert is lacking team uh, people people input and people time, and when an introvert needs a little bit of rest. Um, and also seniority, very relevant for the mining industry, seniority wasn't uh, a factor significantly connected with team effectiveness, which in mining where we typically follow this hierarchical approach um, and have done for hundreds of years um, we are we really need to embrace that at any level someone can be a leader and the younger ones actually have a different viewpoint and therefore their their input is meaningful it's not just the older you get the more important what you say is um, so talking about the generations this, this it really isn't the future of work this is now and I'll explain why 59% of the global workforce are millennials and Gen Z. So millennials are aged 41 to 26, and Gen Z are those under 25 to eight years old. So 59% of our global workforce are millennials and Gen Z. Often people refer to millennials as those, you know, they're, they're, they're just the millennials, thinking they're the young ones. And, and we're, we're not distinguishing between the different generations of Gen Z who are already in the workforce, and also the differences within millennials. Those who are 40 or late 30s, they remember a world without the internet. Those millennials who are in the younger part of that generation don't remember a world without internet. That is a distinct difference. There's also a difference in terms of the, the generations in their experience. So millennials grew up when, when they got a medal for taking part. 
and there were no significant global traumas. The Gen Z, the eldest of that group, saw their, of that generation, saw their parents go through the global financial crisis. Some of them will have been impacted by that. Money is important to them, whereas it's not so important, broadly speaking, to the millennials. The, the youngest of Gen Z have, uh, have had access to iPads and tablets since they were very young. My godson's younger brother, his, who's now 10, his um, first word was iPad. Uh, so they're very used to tech. They use, they find smart tech intuitive. They expect personalization because everything is personalized. They demand companies, Gen Z demand companies to be inclusive, sustainable, um, environmentally and socially responsible, and are not shy of calling out a company or a representative over failures, and particularly on Twitter or Snapchat or TikTok or whatever the latest app is. And then very importantly, they are defined by purpose, which goes back to the study from Google. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why they found those, they came up with those results is because Google's workforce is predominantly a young, younger in the population. Um, interestingly, only 6% of the global workforce are baby boomers. So that's 56 to 75. I would expect that that proportion is higher in the mining industry. And certainly the more senior you get, I would suggest that that baby boomer bracket increases. Uh, I, I encourage anyone in our industry to broaden the age groups that you have involved at every single level of the organization. Uh, you, you don't have to be old to be a leader and the, the younger ones will help the older ones move forward in this, this new normal, especially after COVID-19. Um, and so thinking about the younger generations, the, the younger of Gen Z will have had school and university exams cancelled as a result of COVID-19. That's happened in the UK, that's happening in countries across the world. Um, they, they, they won't be doing their exams at 16, they won't be doing their exams at 18, those, those currently obviously, and, and the final year university lot have had their exams cancelled. They're separated from their friends as a result of the ongoing pandemic. So that is going to create a, a, a significant set of values amongst them that they will then bring into the workforce. What, what's the next generation? It's Gen Alpha. So anyone seven and younger is Gen Alpha. What will their new normal be? Homeschooling, parents remote, remote working as standard and everything virtual, virtual exercise, virtual schooling, uh, only time will tell what expectations they will carry into the workplace. 